All right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to another webinar in our 2021 webinar series on international models and emerging management in collaboration with the International Emerging Management Society and Capacity Building International. Uh, my name is Kyla King. I'm the Managing Director of Capacity Building International, and welcome again to our webinar series. And today, we are actually doing a second part in our uh, three-part series with the University of Manchester. And uh, this is something that I've really been looking forward to. And in this, in our second part of our three-part series, we examine what is meaningful recovery from COVID. A panel of uh, subject matter experts, so those are joining us here today, uh, from TEAMS, the International Emergency Management Society, the UK Emergency Planning Society, and the Resilient Cities Network will provide insights from around the globe as we examine three key questions. And our host here, Duncan Shaw from the University of Manchester, will help us and facilitate that discussion today. But first, before we get into that, I want to make just a couple of, or take a couple of just minutes just to go over a couple of administrative issues really quick. And just because we all have been in webinars before, we're all very familiar with these items, but I'll just cover them very quickly. So again, I'm joined here also by uh, uh, Harold Drager from the president of the International Merchant Management Society. Harold, good to see you again. Hey, good to be here. I look forward for these presentations today. And as previously mentioned, Duncan, Duncan here is here with us as well. And what we are going to discuss um, today, and just to give a, give a brief overview of the series that we've had so far. So 18 out of 24 events, we've had about 1,390 attendees so far and representing 66 nations during a webinar series. But really for today, one important point is the Q and A's and the chat function. So as we're going through the panel discussion today, Please use that Q&A feature. You'll see that in that uh, in the toolbar in Zoom, which you probably already know where that is. And so we want to use that Q&A feature because it allows us to actually print the uh, the reports and have those reports of the questions that we can then give to Duncan later on for part of his research and the work that they're the good work that they're doing over at University of Manchester. And of course, where are you joining us from? Let us know in the Q&A where you're joining us from, and and let us know how wide ranging the audience is today. So. Future webinars coming up. As I mentioned, this is the second of a three-part series. The next one coming up on the 15th of October, I believe. And that's going to be on a discussion on the future of emergency management. After that, if you're following the team series, we're going to be going into smart cities and just one second. Smart cities uh, disaster response with the EPIDIS project and with the EU and data science COVID response and in technology and EM. Now, at this point, I'll turn it over to Duncan. Duncan, over to you, from uh, who will be helping us facilitate the panel discussion today. I'll be working behind the scenes and trying to capture your questions and the chat feature. I'll be monitoring the chat. So definitely, if you have any you know, kind of issues or technical issues or anything else like that, just put them in the chat, and I'll be there trying to help you out with that. Duncan, over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Kyle. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be with you all this afternoon, this morning, this evening. Um, some of you may remember my colleague, David Powell, who facilitated the last session that we had in this series, or the first in this series. So it's my pleasure to um, participate in the second, looking at managing a meaningful recovery. It's a topic that is very close to our hearts at the university. We've been working in recovery coordinating groups in the UK and overseas um, since almost the, the, the first few months of COVID began. We've been um, looking towards what does recovery mean and trying to understand what the process of recovery might look like. As part of that journey, we've been, as I say, working with local government extensively across the UK. We've been working with Ramallah, we've been working with Chile and Vancouver and various other countries, trying to understand what meaningful recovery looks like. And so today we're going to be hearing from four fantastic speakers um, about what recovery means in their parts of the world and thinking about what does um, what does the language of recovery, what does that um, involve and what sort of um, terminology might we want to use. Thinking about the politics of recovery, thinking about the relationships, the partnerships that have been set up during recovery and that might need to continue to be set up. We've been thinking and today we'll be talking about the process of recovery, thinking about understanding the impacts, understanding needs, lessons learned, and all about that process of designing recovery plans, designing renewal strategies, uh, knowing where to start with recovery and where to stop, because recovery has been such a, a significant um, activity um, over the last few months. 
and then really starting to think of what does this word meaningful mean? So we're talking about meaningful recovery, but what does the meaningful mean? And what does managing meaningful recovery mean in that word management? So these are some of the issues that we're going to be covering today um, from our speakers. Um, each of the speakers is going to have an opportunity for um, sharing five to 10 minutes of just general thought around some of those issues. Um, and um, we'll go um, allow them to do their, their speech and then we will start delving into some of the questions that have been shared in advance. So those questions, um, first looking at what is effect, or sorry, how effective were our national and local systems for managing recovery to COVID-19? Um, second question around how effective was strategic advice on recovery um, and supporting those recovery groups and thinking through the, um, the process of recovery. And then the last question around um, standout lessons from managing recovery. Not all of our speakers are involved in the management of recovery, and that's absolutely fine because we want um, different perspectives, different voices coming into this. Um, but all of our speakers are very well versed in um, the context around disasters, recovery planning and so forth. So... Um, Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first um, speaker, um, Stephanie. Stephanie is um, coming to us um, and bringing the voice of the Resilient Cities Network um, to the um, to this uh, meeting today. Um, Stephanie works as a resilience coordinator in Mexico City. She is the secretariat for the Integrative Risk Management and Civil Protection um, Committees within um, Mexico City. She's led disaster risk reduction projects um, across the world. She's been a teacher, a, a coordinator of international cooperation strategies and attache to the UN, um, worked for federal government, um, hugely active in the participation of young professional women in disaster management, and she's a graduate of Georgetown and of University of Chile. So I'm going to uh, invite Stephanie um, to talk about um, some of the work that she has done, um, and then invite Nathan to talk about some of the work that he's been doing, um, then Lucy, and then Jean-Paul. Um, and so, um, Stephanie, uh, may I hand the floor over to you, please? Sure, thank you, Duncan, thank you, Carl. And Carol, thank you everyone for this for joining us to this panel. As um, as you were mentioning, it's important to know what can be the, be done with different, different sectors and different um, and different cities and different so decision makers' perspective. From our side, I'll be sharing with you what has been uh, our main arguments in order to update our resilience strategy based on the response and the uh, and the initial recovery from COVID nineteen actions of the city. With this, I have to start by saying yes, I, uh, from the perspective of the Secretariat of Mexico City for Integrative Risk Management and Civil Protection, it is quite important to notice that first, for uh, for sanitary perspective, the general law uh, the general law mandates that the health sector uh, has the responsible actions for taking and leading the extraordinary actions for leading uh, the sanitary emergencies. And the rest of the cabinet must follow the orientation needs and priorities. With this into account, our uh, our secretariat does a follow up mainly for natural hazards in this perspective. And another one that recently and unfortunate happened within the subway of Mexico City. This is some specific and tropic hazards. And by now I'll start with this um, general perspective on who led the main response. First, it was indeed um, the health secretariat, but for this management of the COVID-19 response, I have to remind and recall, sorry, that the city also have a somehow uh, recent experience since the 2010 influenza pandemic of AH1N1 was the first, Mexico was one of the first countries to uh, recall the WHO in order to know what was happening. And this led us to know that it was important to know which, uh, to know that we have to nurture mechanisms, preparedness, uh, plans for pandemics, but also for now coming from if even, even 11 years after, what, can, what was done, right? So for now, this perspective was not only to display the importance of having scientific basis or having the, uh, or attending what the normative says, but also if the main challenge was to test our management systems for the response, but also seeing it as a comprehensive, uh, a comprehensive one. In order and afterwards, the initial recovery actions. In order to know who did what in our city, it is important to say that um, the health sector oriented the whole government and the head of uh, the whole government. This health sector is led here by the Dr. Oliva, 
and then um, the head of government, Dr. Claudia Sheinbaum, had a leading role and also held important and constant press conference to communicate what was going what was going on the discussions with the local metropolitan and federal governments. So she communicated this whole general perspective and background uh, of the pandemic the management in, and had a strong support of the Digital Agency of Public Innovation. This is one of the main um, aggregated facts and values of this strategy because it was not only talking about policies and the whole technical perspective or even bureaucratic sometimes, but it was also about telling the people what, how, and when to go in order, um, in a very um, easy way to understand how to respond and what they can do within their networks. Other topics that were mentioned through the conferences and during this, the initial strategy were, of course, how to manage the response and access to public services, and also the important public partnership, um, ally, uh, public partnership facilities to provide access to health services or where even there wasn't weren't enough. Um, there were also participation of other secretariats for mobility, tourism, citizen security, depending on what their or their or proportion or contribution from their sectors provided. But something quite important as well is that there was a strong uh, and quick response from the legal council office in order to see how to our government to continue their operations and which were the conditions on their, uh, the whole sectors could still carry their own activities. So once I have mentioned like the whole, how to know who did what in general, these were the main principles that guided the response for Mexico City strategy. And these were not only for the response, these are still ongoing for the, uh, some recovery activities, but in this, uh, I would say that the, the leading role of the head of government also enabled the draft, not only these principles, but also being adapted because the, most of these principles are um, are still, or were still drafted, were being drafted, I'm sorry, at the reconstruction st uh, strategy that started after the 2017 earthquake that hit the city. And these were, these were part, most of these were part of, of what had to be done or what was the vision that citizens that were affected by, uh, by an impact, and I would say affected not necessarily agents of, of change or, or uh, with a more proactive capacity, what would, what would be happening after uh, from the role from the government and what, what would be done in order to communicate where and how each of the sectors should uh, participate. And this, um, with these principles, it's just a matter for you to know is that um, this helped us to identify first the needs, um, <clears throat> which were the uh, sectorial decision making that had to be that had to be done in which type of priorities, who should co uh, communicate with whom. Um, <clears throat> another aspect is that this enabled as well to urge the reactivation of justice services, and at some point did inter get interrupted. It wasn't a 24-7 service. And I, it's common for emergencies, but these were also a leading, uh, these were also um, basis that enhanced and urged how to reactivate some of these public uh, services. Another strategic consideration was that there was an important uh, effort in order to decrease any restraints so the, from accessing to health services that we have a no different type and many types of health services health services in the city, but for the response, there was an homologous um, participation from different sectors. And if in and in some point, even for attending or accessing to a second level of attention, people could go to private to some private hospitals to get the attention in in where the public service was um, even where the public service was at the top of their uh, capacities for attending COVID uh, cases. Uh, here I'd like to show you, um, I mean, this is important, what I have told you about the principles, not only because we were having the, we're still ongoing with the reconstruction strategy ongoing, but also because within a context that we are living and most of the uh, different cities that we see even through the country did not have activate these um, mechanisms and communication services or even access to information. And there's also the a strong austerity plan happening in Mexico City, and so this in, in like, like looking at the on the macro level, it no longer seems obvious or as a minimum effort, and it's something that challenges uh, ch keeps challenging us. And here is what why and 
Mm, this is important because it, this refers to the part of, okay, so who decides what is important? The, in this, uh, during this whole response and racial recovery that we have been having in the city, they, these are the eight decision-making groups, mechanisms that have been created, and we identify from uh, the lock, uh, these attached are uh, topics from the local economy, the economic level, metropolitan governance, each response to a specific goals. And we know each has, a, uh, each is important, but I kept wondering if this is something that was challenges, challenging us at the resilience office is what would happen with a uh, strong earthquake, no? which we had a couple of weeks ago. So would we be having a new mechanism or we, we have a special research for the event of the subway, as I mentioned at the beginning, but as the list could increase according to the hazard, uh, something that we were wondering is what would we be doing in order for the, all of these mechanisms to stay relevant? What can we, we do to be held this accountable and with public attention? How can we better prepare the city for a macro a structure and, and to not be afraid of recovery or just uh, giving it a uh, like agenda with no specific uh, response or um, result? Uh, so something else that we did and wanted to share is that we identified which type of programs were uh, were offered. Some of them were existing. Some of them were just specific for attending um, epidemiological services. And some others uh, were, were new. And this is important because we know that according to the hazard and impact, the needs will be different. But And we will be happy to share this with you because the list is really impressive. But it was more more about this uh, this exercise is that we uh, try to identify which could be the roles and functions that different sectoral structure institutions could participate depending on the hazard. Most, most of these activities could be repeated in different uh, in different response uh, strategies. So we could also uh, this is where we see an important opportunity to engage and to further develop capacities. Of first of prevention, preparedness, and with other institutions that did not have disaster risk reduction or disaster response institutionalized, not even with their civil protection plan. <laughs> so this is some one of the main um, reflections that we have after seeing which were the services and programs that we were being offered. From the Secretariat's contribution, we did a technical assessment uh, based on updating protocols, providing us a companionship and yeah, constant uh, dialogue with different partners from the private sector, from public, uh, from pu public institutions, and what we did were yes, going to uh, public services, accessing and, and giving counseling to families in the hospitals. There was a technical effort for providing a socioeconomic impact assessment at a high level uh, working group with a, uh, with a specific um, secretariat, and this was an effort and evaluation made among with the Economic Commission for Latin America uh, from the ECLAC. Something we also did was the support in the, command system, uh, in the command system center in order to provide attention for people with uh, suspicious of COVID, assistance in sanitary filters, and social pr preparedness. But most of it was based in increasing the risk communication uh, awareness in different sectors and to better prepare and adapt our instruments and protocols. This was apart from the fact that we uh, were considering and are still working on the update of the, our resilience strategy based on recognizing that each sector has an important role in order to prepare, not only having the main, um, the same institutions or the same groups deciding the same, because we, as we've seen in the, in the in this part of the set of the services and programs, there are different initiatives and facilities that need to be um, that need to be considered for the response. Some just to finalize our opportunities for having a resilient city that considers a recover a, a, a meaningful recovery is that yes, we did have an intergovernmental coordination. We did in, increase our cross sectoral partnerships. There were the pro existing programs helped to speed the uh, provide the provision of economic transfers and health support, but also this was another important opportunity to take digitalization to another level, access to uh, for the population and for us as the public institutions, and another opportunity was to update our main in document the resilience strategy because it needn't consider uh, this type of hazards, needn't. Uh, seismic risk or uh, even social development components. 
So this was our main opportunity that we're taking these ones that are in the green, uh, the green square and something that we are working on and some opportunities that we have to enhance is to continue contributing to the planning instruments in order to have a multi-hazard approach, not only consider, all oh, this is for risk, this is are for floods or uh, different uh, or, or other phenomena, mainstreaming uh, DRR in order to see that we have seen that uh, different sectors have an important contribution, but we didn't have these technical and permanent uh, work with them. For example, the finance, social protection, and this was uh, not a, a main opportunity also to consider what I was mentioning you before with the decision-making mechanisms. How can we do this institutional structure for recovery planning and long-term recovery policies? What do we consider or, or, or should it, which mechanism will provide their own uh, goals? So what, what, can we do, what can we do and, and strengthen in order to not, um, yeah, to uh, try to omit that the good will will happen eventually to whom, whomever has leading the, the response strategies in the future. And finally, just to finalize that each uh, role has an important, each sector has an important role in the disaster management cycle for us. These are the main um, considerations that we want to share from Mexico City perspective. And yeah, just these are my contact details. And thank you so much for the opportunity. I hope I didn't pass too much of time. But yeah. Thank you so much. Um, that was really insightful. Um, there, there's so many lessons there, but I, I realise that we're going to have opportunity to bring this together in discussion group. But uh, you know, agents of change and having very clear principles. Thinking, you've talked a lot about governance, which I think is something that we'll really pick up on. But um, that agents of change uh, phrases keep um, going around in my head, so I, I think that's something that we'll certainly pick up on as well. Uh, thank you very much, Stephanie. May I hand over to Kyle? Thanks, Doug, and yeah, and thanks, Stephanie. Very insightful presentation. And what we'll do now, so I just wanted to take a couple of seconds here to introduce Nathan Rogers, who's joining us now, and give us a, a few minutes just to share his thoughts on uh, what he's seeing from his perspective. And so Nathan is a seasoned professional with 18 years of experience in the emergency management field and over 15 years with the U.S. Federal Emergency Management Agency. During that time, Nathan served as a United States Permanent Representative to NATO's Civil Emergency Planning Committee representing the U.S. on policy matters regarding civil preparedness and crisis management. Nathan currently is the CEO of the Canmore Company and supports U.S. government efforts in building resilience in partner nations. Nathan, thanks for joining us and over to you. Great. Yeah, thank you, Kyle. Appreciate that uh, introduction and uh, greetings uh, to everyone, uh, uh, Kyle and Harold and Duncan, thanks so much for the organization here and, and, and bringing me into this discussion. My fellow panelists, looking forward to uh, the dialogue here today. Uh, and thanks for, frankly, taking on this topic. I think this is one that uh, will be with us for some time. Uh, you know, just hearing the word recovery uh, at this point in COVID, you know, I always sort of tilt my head uh, towards that connection as I don't think we're quite there yet. Of course, it's important to view it from a continuous improvement standpoint, which this is, uh, I think, a contributing element to that. These discussions uh, very much contribute uh, to this rolling evaluation as we stay on top of uh, our, our ability to continuously improve our response. So thanks uh, for organizing this discussion. Kyle, you mentioned you know, I've got a career in emergency management, uh, and certainly uh, that's where my mind uh, often goes when I when think about the COVID response here. Uh, but my last experience uh, in government service anyway, working with the international community on this topic, uh, just further reiterates uh, the importance of, uh, of connectedness, you know, the interdependency uh, that we share uh, across, uh, across borders, not just jurisdictions at local levels, not just regions in one country, but of course among, uh, among the international community. And so uh, some of my remarks are, are with that in mind, uh, as well as the kind of national and and, and sort of more local or regional uh, emergency management, but really delighted to be a part of this. Uh, you know, I think there's a few things that just for Wavetop's opening here uh, that come to mind as we uh, consider the questions before us uh, for this session. And uh, again, that we'll be revisiting in the future, but we, we talk about effectiveness of, of recovery programs uh, and recovery efforts uh, that certainly varies by the lens, right? Effectiveness varies greatly by the lens in which it's being looked through. And I think uh, when we think about if it's by, uh, you know, casualty counts, death rates, you know, the things we see in the headlines most often 
Uh, I think there's a tendency to uh, have rather negative connotations towards the effectiveness of COVID response and recovery. Uh, but then you could also look at effectiveness of, uh, of you know, bringing the community together, the effectiveness of citizen uh, you know, resilience to some extent, the, the effectiveness of public-private partnerships, which I'm sure will, will be a theme here as we get into it, uh, you know, the effectiveness of uh, our ability, uh, tens of millions of people to basically upend and, and dramatically shift uh, their day-to-day -day lives uh, and put things on hold. And for a, a, a restless nation like the United States and others, a uh, very restless nation, uh, that that takes, um, that's a big change and takes a lot for uh, citizens used to a certain way of life to be uh, disrupted in a certain way. And so there, I think there, in, there's arguments on both sides here. We're looking forward to the discussion here on effectiveness here of, of the recovery and again, what lens we're actually looking through uh, in engaging that or evaluating that level of, of, of effectiveness. I think you also have to look at um, you know, so some of the good news in the sense of uh, there, there's been certainly an increasing emphasis on emergency management in recent years. Uh, we're seeing more EM programs than we ever have uh, in history. Of course, they're, they're emerging in or at organizational levels. Uh, this is far from becoming a government-only uh, initiative, of course. We're seeing emergency management programs throughout industry and in academic institutions, international institutions now embracing uh, emergency management collaborative forums. So it's very encouraging uh, to, to, to see those developments, also encouraging to see the dynamic with the public health community, you know, as a, again, career emergency manager, there, there traditionally was this dynamic and interesting special relationship, I'll call it, between the emergency management community and the public health community uh, when it comes to crisis management. And it was something that we long sought after to, to, to really foster a, a, a close relationship there, uh, given the uh, critical interdependency of, of incident management priorities. And, and here we have one at, 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 the, at, at the tremendous scale that, we, that we're now operating with uh, you know, this global uh, pandemic, I think that it drives those two communities further and further together. But this also recognizes that the, the pandemic, this scenario really offers uh, challenges that no other scenario uh, offers. Uh, there, there, there's no tape around this scenario. I, I can't put, uh, you know, uh, certain, you know, caution tape around it and, and control one scene, for example, or even just in one jurisdiction, one country. Uh, and it requires that broad, much broader engagement than emergency management in the public health uh, communities. And I think that's one of the things, one of the big uh, lessons coming out of this is really looking at emergency management as a discipline and factoring in, you know, what is its responsibility here when it comes to uh, not just managing COVID, but the resilience from such a wide, wide, wide scope, widely scoped crisis. Uh, nothing reaches the, the, the ends, the depths, the, 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 the general breadth of our economy, frankly, than than a pandemic and this global health crisis. And so further drives the need for emergency management to demonstrate its role as that lead convening authority in many, for many jurisdictions anyway, in pulling in the various uh, capabilities required for that full systems response. Because this does in fact require uh, an, an all hands on deck. Yes, emphasis in the public health sector. Yes, our health systems are tested uh, dramatically here, but this requires industry often to step in and provide private private sector solutions this requires uh, you know those non-traditional actors to really play a bigger role here uh, in their community first and foremost in, in supporting their neighbors and 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 those uh, that they impact uh, most you know day to day we talk about resilience often and a lot of we really we really learn through this process uh, you know those that are essential for our day-to-day -day lives and our day-to-day -day economy uh, and, and making that run you know it's yes public health public safety, but it's grocery store workers, delivery drivers, it's janitors, it's you know, the, the social workers. You know these these folks. Uh, I think there's a renewed spotlight on on these. I would say also local heroes that are really helping sustain um, to the way possible our, our our way of life to the best extent possible. So uh, you know, hats off certainly to those the, those groups. So again, effectiveness. This is a question of effectiveness. Really depends on the lens. I think we're looking through it. Uh, I think in many cases, it's been highly effective in driving cooperation, driving the need to maintain focus on emergency preparedness. This, this amplifies and, and, and completely, uh, or certainly helps justify uh, investment in mitigation, investment in preparedness planning at all levels. Uh, we've, we must maintain a uh, focus on these topics uh, at the highest levels. We must have the legislative backing 
uh, to free up the resources, to enable nations to respond accordingly. So if there's, you know, there's an expression in the business, many of on the line here are familiar, familiar with this, but you know, never let a good disaster go to waste here. This is one of, uh, of, of, a, of a proportion that will have widespread lessons throughout our society that I'm hopeful emergency management communities in particular can, again, use their convening authority and, and that capacity to fuse these lessons together uh, and so that these we are continuously improving our plans and process and, and capability. And, and also, and this was alluded to earlier, you know, restoring some faith in our institutions. I think it's one thing we talk, I think another question we'll get into here is, you know, the, the provision of strategic advice, right? How, and that's really, there's a people part to that, but there's an institution part to that. And I think both have been under extreme strain here. And so part of this process, uh, as we think about evaluating or, you know, the, the effectiveness of, of COVID recovery here is, is restoring faith in institutions and reiterating the importance uh, of continuity in these institutions. Uh, and revisiting some uh, of those traditional, uh, you know, values, principles, uh, and, and capacities that we've relied on for so long, and those institutions that execute uh, those those capacities and capabilities on a regular basis. So, I'm looking forward very much to to that uh, discussion here as we get further into into the details. But I think you know we balance this 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 people versus the institutional piece uh, quite often here, and as we've seen in the U.S. and elsewhere. Uh, you know, we it, there, there's an interesting dynamic to, to be mindful of also in our discussion today, and that is this relationship between you know leadership and politicization. And in in our in many countries, right, we have leaders who are politicians, and we've seen uh, how dangerous, frankly, I would say it can be when a crisis is politicized, and how it costs. Uh, you know, there are certainly some arguments for how how that can cost ultimately lives, but it, it shapes the resource management, it shapes the overall national posture, and it shapes the messaging. Uh, it, it bears weight on the credibility of institutions that we've relied on so long for being the central authority on the matter and providing that advice uh, to the citizenry. And so when you look at a population like the U.S. Uh, and its scope and scale, we have such a layered response to crisis management, which again, typically works very well, and we rely on it heavily, but it also enables that many more sets of leaders and that many more sets of decision makers and more sets of political processes and to, to really weigh in to the decisions uh, that are affecting uh, the lives of obviously their jurisdictions, their communities, uh, but that can have ripple effects well beyond their borders. So I think my message here, there's, there is an absolute uh, critical role more than ever for the emergency management community to step in as that convening authority to rally the rally this whole of society, well beyond, well beyond government, this whole of society uh, connectedness on this topic, uh, as well as reaching out uh, and, and building the capacity, moving us forward uh, towards a greater uh, state of resiliency, you know, locally, uh, regionally, nationally, and certainly internationally. I think as at the, in the NATO forums and the EU forums, uh, OCE forums, you know, we talk about resilience being a national responsibility violently agree with that. However, I would argue that there is an international, you know, collective imperative that we work together on this topic. And if we should absolutely be using COVID as a galvanizing force, frankly, to convene forms like this and, and elsewhere, uh, share these practices and come out of this uh, much stronger uh, than we went into it, because this, this will happen again. We must be of the mindset that these hazards and threats we face increasing in complexity, they're increasing in severity, this will come back around, uh, and so we, we we must take these hard lessons on board and and have honest take an honest view at ourselves as an international response community, uh, and really go forward as as smartly as we can for a greater state of resilience in the future. So anyway, Kyle, thanks. I, I just some some opening uh, scene setting here. Looking forward to the discussion with my fellow uh, panelists here on on how we go about doing that and some other assessment uh, perhaps findings I can share as we uh, move along here, but. Effectiveness matters, varies greatly by the lens. Leadership matters. The relationship between leadership and politicization is a critical uh, one that we must be mindful of. Uh, and then again, resilience, national responsibility, collective imperative. Uh, these are some of the main themes I think I'll be, I'll be hitting on here as we go forward in our discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Nathan, much appreciated. And Duncan, I see you're back, so I'll hand it over to you. 
I am. Uh, thank you again, Nathan, for that. That was uh, a really great um, uh, tour around many of the big issues. Just in your summing up, uh, some of the other things that you talked about um, that really struck a chord with um, issues that we're facing in the UK is that notion of a restless nation. People have a certain way of life. They want to get back to that certain way of life. And, and what does that mean for recovery? So we've uh, very much, a lot of the recovery groups have been talking about business as usual. Let's get back to business as usual. Let's uh, stop talking about the pandemic. And uh, we can understand the reason for that. But um, whether now is the right time for that or whether maybe that's something that needs to be thought about a little bit later is, is open for discussion. Uh, something else you mentioned with that whole society um, aspect and uh, something that is really um, important in the UK at the moment. Um, and we've been talking also about hyper-local is local, but then hyper-local. So getting down to street level, community level and really thinking about that. So, so many things you touched upon, Nathan. So thank you very much for that talk. Um, and we'll, we'll pick up on many of those uh, in the discussion, as you said. Um, so I'd like to um, introduce our next speaker, uh, Lucy Easthope. Lucy is bringing um, the voice of the Emergency Planning Society to the meeting today. She has been uh, working in recovery during disaster. She, for over two decades, she's been challenging people to think differently about the aftermath of such tragic events that we've seen in the UK and overseas. Uh, she's been very active at national and local community levels within the UK and overseas. And uh, I'm going to be listening with interest as, uh, as I heard Lucy talk about some of the very passionate experiences. Maybe that's not the right wording. She's talked very passionately about some of the experiences she, that she had uh, in working with her local community during the early days of COVID in a recent talk that she gave um, in the UK. She's very active in the Emergency Planning Society um, and she's a fellow of that society. She's an author, a professor in practice at University of Durham, co-founder of the Aster After Disaster Network, uh, researcher at Massey University and at University of Bath. Uh, Lucy, um, I'd like to hand over and uh, give you the opportunity to share some of your thoughts, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me today. It's an absolute, an absolute privilege. Um, I've sort of focused in a little bit um, just briefly because I know I want to get to the discussion session very much on uh, the personal uh, um, the toll, the personal labour of responding, I think, in recovery. Um, and also, you know, what it feels like as emergency planners in the UK uh, to see this uh, event. Um, those of you who work in the UK, but also many other countries have a similar structure. We have a national risk register um, and a pandemic, albeit in terms of some of the way it was described, an influenza pandemic was considered our highest risk. Um, and we also plan for other types of, of pandemic very, very religiously, including a corona pandemic. And one of the things that we um, would do, even though the delegates in the room would fight us on this, we would plan for recovery. So one of the first things I think that the Emergency Planning Society in the UK had to do, and I saw commentators do it in many other countries too, particularly from my experience in the US, was bust a myth that this pandemic had come over the horizon completely uh, unprepared and unexpected. And um, we had been dipping our toes into the last few years of, of really pointing out to the nation and to journalists and to others that emergency planning was a thing and that we used emergency planning to prepare communities. And so, uh, you know, for example, with me, I've done a couple of quite, quite um, resonating explosive articles in sort of 2017, 2018 about, hey, you know, when those spontaneous centres are built after flooding, they're not a surprise that they're built by emergency planners. So one of the things that was very interesting, you know, journalists were very interested in very quickly was the idea of there is emergency plans. And then what they came back and said is, ah, oh, yes, but you plan for response. You can't possibly plan for recovery. And of course, that had been a huge part of UK emergency planning. And we, we'd formalised it. It's um, part of our non-statutory guidance that accompanies our legislation. And we'd issued guidance in 2007. But Recovery is inherently political with both a big P and a small P. And the idea of updating that guidance and various other pieces of work around it had certainly started to fade by the time of the pandemic. But one thing I would say I think that's perhaps quite challenging is by the time the pandemic came, there were just enough of us who had been really, really um, trumpeting and selling recovery management that 
it didn't get missed off at a local response level. And I get teased quite a lot because when I do media, I talk about the being local plans a lot and sort of using it as a kind of get out of jail card. Hey, you know, this bit got screwed up, but there were always local plans. But I, I do really want to salute that because that was, you know, if I look back over my archive, we were doing workshops. The Manchester work was already, uh, you know, we knew of, we knew of great universities already doing stuff. We were, we were already, uh, it was the thing. So by the time of the pandemic, that was a very important protective factor for us. There's always a protective factor, and then there's always a challenge. And I think one of the challenges with local planning was that the resilience for a structure, let's see what we conclude over the next couple of years, was quite difficult to embed, as, as Duncan was using the language, the sort of hyper-local, the difficult, quiet voice, um, to hear um, non uh, to, to hear sort of non-conventional ideas in. Um, and we had struggled with a number of earlier incidents in the UK. Uh, we have major incidents all the time, as everywhere does. So what we were seeing was the local resilience forum was struggling with the long termism of recovery and would also try and stay in a, in a tactical response form. And so one of the things in, in the last year that slightly troubled me is that the same people who were at the strategic response just sort of took off one hat, put on another and became recovery coordinators. And that isn't what I believe recovery to be. You know, you've got to make much more space for community voices. And most importantly, something that was enshrined beautifully in the New Zealand recovery guidance, which really, I think, has become a Bible to recovery uh, planners like myself. I'll put it in the chat. But the, the New Zealand companion through the chaos is enshrining and protecting the role of the wild card in recovery. Now, it's funny enough, I've just come from another meeting this afternoon, and one of the conversations in that was about the toll that it takes on recovery advisors <laughs> to advise on recovery. Um, because you are probably listened to, if it's a ratio, maybe one in 50 answers. Um, the other 49 may be de deemed um, not politically correct, not optically correct, not how we're planning to take the public in this particular way. Um, they may not be resource possible. They may have legal implications. So it's very hard sometimes as a recovery advisor. You know, one of the things I was very pleased with by the time of the pandemic was I was wearing quite a, th a thick coat of scars um, from recovery advice because um, I had I got very used to things either landing in soil and growing or landing in soil and just being kicked away because of the political situation. So on a very personal level, in terms of my personal self-care and my family resilience, I was not perhaps as bruised as I was with earlier disasters when, when politically some things didn't land. Um, the other thing that I've thought a lot about, and it's actually why I joined social media during the pandemic for the first time, was delivering recovery messages is very similar to being, say, a clinician. Because people will say to you, when does this feel better? When does this feel better? When does this feel better? And you're saying, this is it now. There will be really good days ahead, but this is a disaster. Give it the gravitas it deserves. You know, it, it has changed me and you. And so one of the difficulties is people, um, and particularly in local resilience forums, clinging to the idea of a, a magic wand that would bring back business as usual, whatever that was. And I, I had already articulated that quite extensively in my work, The Recovery Myth, where I would really made clear that recovery is, is something that will take much longer than anybody expects, be much more painful. And the afterwards is good again, very much like people like Rebecca Solnit write about. The afterwards is good again, but you have to acknowledge the hereth, which I write about in my new book, which is the feeling of a life from before that is now just an echo. So all of us here will never now live a life that doesn't have at least two or three years in the middle of it or at the end of it or early stages career or wherever that is punctuated by this disaster. And at the start of this, that was unsayable in national meetings. That was enough for the call to go quiet. And then, thank you, Lucy, that's all we need from you today. And then a follow-up that 
you know, that really wasn't the message. Um, this wasn't a disaster. You know, you're, you're, you're overthinking this. You've gone too big. You're using your disaster recovery tools. That's for other disasters, not for this. And that, um, I was so glad that I've walked that path many times before as a recovery advisor, <laughs> because that's quite a brutal process. So going forward, I think we're in a very uh, exciting place. I use that very deliberately with, um, you know, the, the, the points that Nathan has already made, that the, the pandemic provides a number of um, uh, opportunities. These are all very difficult words to use around disaster, but opportunities to look at where we're at. Um, the, the UK is just starting to get to the stage where it's articulating its impact assessment. Now, of course, that feels far too late for a recovery planner, but I understand why it's taken so long is because at earlier stages, those messages couldn't be heard. And we had this sort of malevolent buffer. So people would still be able to pick up a meal deal at the supermarket and they would not give this the gravitas it deserves. We have a, a death toll worthy of a disaster with a lot of a complicated bereavement and ambiguous loss. It has caused severe damage to our National Health Service and probably one of the biggest recovery challenges we are now dealing with is the mental health toll on our youth and our children some of which has come from some of the psychological interventions that we used in the early stages of response that those of us in recovery begged should not be used because we could we were horizon scanning which is what recovery planners do so we're in a in an incredibly dangerous time and the most important thing i think for recovery planners is what i call the gandalf ambivalence from the lord of the rings um, where frodo says to gandalf i wish none of this had happened you know i wish the ring had not come to me and gandalf says you know so do all that see these times and uh, but you know what is what is important now is what we have what we do with them what we do with these times um and that's a really important point when we're looking at meaningful recovery because we have to take stock of now we didn't want to see this as as pandemic planners which is what emergency planners are we have seen it so what is on our shoulders now is what we do with what we've seen Great, thank you, Lucy. That that's absolutely that's very insightful, you know. And, and I think it's, you know, the discussion around zero risk is, is really interesting in terms of, you know, as we talked about getting back to normal. What is risk? What is zero risk? Can you ever get to zero risk? No, you, of course you cannot. So what is the level we're going to accept so that we allow people to move forward? And it's a really interesting discussion uh, that we're that uh, you know hopefully we can get more into. But right now, we're, we'll go over to Jean-Paul. So Jean-Paul is joining us. Um, just to give a quick introduction to Jean-Paul, just one second. So anyway, uh, Jean-Paul is has been working in uh, civil protection for a number of years and has also worked as an EU expert in terms of civil protection and preparedness and is also on the board of the International Emergency Management Society. So Jean-Paul, thanks again for joining us. And now we'll just turn the floor to you for a couple of minutes to give us some initial thoughts on recovering from uh, COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle, uh, inviting me to this uh, brilliant session. Uh, and uh, I, uh, there, there were so many things uh, that the previous speakers told that, that I'm overwhelmed by all of these informations, to be honest. So uh, um, I will try to give you some um, lessons learned uh, because in, in France, uh, we were not uh, very good uh, at the beginning. And I want to, to give a, a first um, remark to Lucy. Um, some many years ago, uh, I was in the National Fire Academy teaching emergency planning. And we met some uh, searcher in um, human science, let's say. And uh, during, um, after presenting uh, hope, uh, a half a day, respectively, our works, and uh, during the meal, because in France there is a meal, uh, um, the people, uh, the, the searchers told me, so you are planning, but if I well understand, the planning is, is more to reassure you rather than, you, than to help you when the, the, the incident occurs. So, that was a case uh, that was a very interesting remark, uh, emphasizing that 
uh, we are planning, but when the disaster strikes, it's always not fully prepared. So th that, that was, of course, uh, largely the case uh, last year when uh, a pandemic strikes. And uh, as France is a very centralized country by historical, by historical reasons, um, there was national um, management and manage national planning also. But the first month, let's say January, uh, the first th three months in France were very bad. Uh, because at first uh, the, there was some uh, some uh, lying persons in, in Paris, especially about the masks, uh, because there was a penury of masks, and they were they were minimizing the use the use less the use of the masks and the efficiency of the masks. And the first lesson is when you have to uh, to manage an unusual crisis. First lesson is not to lie, uh, uh, because if you are an industrial managing an industrial hazard or the same or a natural one by five men, you don't lie about the truth. And also, what is difficult is, especially in this crisis, to express the uncertainty. Uncertainty is everywhere, every, every time. And uh, uh, the the. The first question is how effective was the national system? It was very ineffective during the first months until the first uh, lockdown in uh, March. Uh, uh, we can say it was a chaotic uh, uh, crisis management. And um, <clears throat> uh, one of the reasons, my, my, uh, following my analysis, one of the reasons of this chaotic uh, starting up was that um, the government was at first reluctant to take the command fully at interagency level. Uh, the, the first months were uh, only health ministry crisis management, and they took too much time to uh, to to take the command. And another it. Was well, I think this is not me on this occasion. This might be Jean-Paul. <laughs> okay, so why don't we just go ahead and move on, Duncan, so that we can start with the questions, because I think Jean-Paul was going in that direction anyway. So uh, thank you um, to all three speakers, uh, of course, to Jean-Paul as well once he returns. But um, there have been so many things that we've um, covered um, across those three talks. Um, obviously, the uh, many of you have... Um, already addressed the questions. And I wonder if I can start to drill down on some of the specific issues that you've been talking about, one of which was politics. And I think Lucy really talked about some of the politics that she's experienced through um, the, the, some of those difficult conversations, raising difficult points, and then being asked maybe not to raise those difficult points. Um, I just wondered, Stephanie, in the context of Mexico, um, some of the work that you've been doing in, in those, uh, have you experienced similar things? Um, have you, uh, how have the politics politics been within Mexico City? Well, quite exciting. I mean, just as trying to use uh, Lucy's uh, reprisal, right, in order to get in. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, and I refer to exciting because it gets quite an uh, anxious moment. Last year, I, I joined the Secretariat, but also last year, there was a strong discussion about a uh, deputy chamber as part of a federal order to uh, eliminate the federal funds for disaster for attending disasters. So this this was quite a, a limitative moment because there weren't any country balances, and there at the moment there weren't enough uh, processes that enable or look to dialogue with civil society and with other institutions. Now, I mean, the discussion happened. There were, and I was part of more civil society groups that, back then, and. It was a very challenging uh, moment, but now uh, a couple, like two months ago, there were the new, um, the new, the, the new terms of reference for the, for the these type of funds that may be seen. But it, uh, uh, as you may say, it, these are insufficient. We are not having, not in, I mean, it's never sufficient to have uh, the emergency funds. But in these terms, I, it's also part of who have been drafting uh, this 
getting to know the politics, it's important to see who ha who's the person behind this drafting of terms of reference, what's the point of, or, or who are we targeting with the uh, provision of transfers, and what are we really uh, trying to, to solve or to decrease in terms of vulnerability and exposure of the population. And this is something that is still and unfortunate for the city and for the uh, for and for the country because no um, no further lessons and experiences from previous disasters were seriously taken with, with these new terms. So this is something that what is our main challenge and well it will happen and and, and in having implications in the long term because changing a law or even having these uh, new funds is quite challenging and as I mentioned the austerity plans are very important and strong. So without this investment, without us, not even in the secretariat, we have um, funds for normal programs, you know? So it's it becomes challenging. It becomes something that we make some other cities and some other actors share, but it's something that we have to mention and put on the table that it's a, a, a pending theft to the citizenship for the city. Uh, great points, thank you. And, and something that I'm thinking Nathan might have a view on in, in terms of that funding of resilient, that the funding of recovery um, in FEMA in the United States. Um, how does how does the funding of recovery work, Nathan? Are you able to shed a little bit of light on that for us, please? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Duncan, for the questions. And uh, you know, it certainly plays a big part, uh, right, in, in getting communities uh, back uh, on their feet, if you will. Um, but fortunately, you know, FEMA has gone through a tremendous revamp, I would say, of uh, of how they offer uh, and provide uh, such assistance uh, to make it much uh, more easily accessible, much more rapid, I would say, in, in delivery. I mean, we're uh, we're you know, hat off now. FEMA no longer wearing the hat, but FEMA is now able to you know much more uh, rapidly deploy not just capabilities and resources and things, which uh, is certainly critical, but uh, on the financial support end, you know much more quickly uh, able to uh, deploy financial help during even during disaster. We saw this during the uh, sort of the triple threat, the hurricanes. We we recently you know the Harvey Irma Maria combination where. You know, streets are still flooded, and FEMA is is cutting checks. Uh, short, you know, short right right around that time. It, it was it was pretty uh, helpful, and a lot of that goes to the capability uh, up front to better assess the damage, right? Better better obtain information from local leaders and incident management teams. So there's a relationship here between our ability to respond, our capabilities that we're improving, uh, and our decision making with providing the assistance in a most tailored and useful and effective way. I mean, this is, at the end of the day, these are disaster funds. This is, the, the, you know, these, are, these are taxpayer funds. So we must be mindful of, of how, as much as we wanna, we wanna you know, push, 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 and, and get it to where it's needed as, most, as quickly as we can, uh, you know, we must do so as, as smartly and as efficiently as possible. And so I think FEMA's done a lot in the way of their public assistance um, uh, process, public assistance uh, funding, uh, survivor assistance, their focus on survivor assistance uh, has been, I think, uh, tremendously improved in, in recent years. But, you know, we've had to live some hard lessons to get there. Um, you, you know, the evolution of emergency management in this country, uh, there, there, there's a good story there. there it's, it's kind of, there's, there's some, again, hard lessons in that story, uh, you know, from its, from its origins through uh, usually it's, you know, disasters, not surprisingly, that, that shape uh, national uh, reforms and legislation for change. Including uh, the federal government, national government's ability to provide uh, certain levels of financial and other assistance. So you know, we've seen in, in the U.S. this this pendulum. You know, we, we've we've we're FEMA largely focused uh, natural hazards before 9/11, uh, and, and 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 focused on you know, th those response recovery uh, you know missions. 9/11 really swung the pendulum towards the counterterrorism. And, and man-made threat and shifted FEMA's authorities with it. Uh, and then Katrina happened, right? This is 20, so 25, 26, 2006, legislation kicked in, really uh, brought the pendulum back towards the middle of this all hazard approach. And now we, of course, we're dealing with uh, you know, the greatest pandemic here in a century and, and all the effects we're still reeling from. Uh, it really goes to show the, the, the scope, scale, breadth of a capacity that a national emergency management system needs to have, including as you mentioned, during recovery, what funds are being provided to get communities back on their feet? How are we supporting businesses? 
you know, frankly, there, there, there is no recovery without the private sector. That's just a, you know, flat out, there's no economy without industry. We've got to be mindful of that as government, that there is no recovery without the private sector. So how are we supporting small businesses, given the lion's share of that private sector is small business, uh, where something like this, you know, just one flood, one, you know, many of these are on you know, one disaster. It could be a small uh, disaster in the grand scheme of things, but to that business, it's everything. You know, they, they've lost the storefront, they've lost uh, lost their, their 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 footprint. So we've got to be mindful of of the industry involvement here, as we uh, also provide that survivor assistance, provide the business assistance, and getting uh, getting communities back online. But you know, generally, I think and and FEMA's not alone, by the way. Other federal agencies providing assistance uh, to this. Uh, FEMA certainly leads. I think a lot of these efforts when it comes to directly uh, uh, providing survivors and with with uh, the financial tools available. Um, to to get them back on their feet, or at least provide them some sense of uh, of stability for those initial weeks, uh, probably the hardest weeks of their lives um, following uh, such a such a tragedy. So, anyway, my, mindful of those developments. Always interested to learn. I, I'd say from other nations how they're supporting their local communities and and regions. Uh, but I think a FEMA's model has matured significantly. Uh, we're we are in I would say a much much better place in that capacity than we have been. Uh, in in even even recent years, but certainly over the past uh, a decade or so, uh, in that in that regard. So great, it's a great topic, warrants its own full discussion, I'd, I'd say. Uh, but from what I've seen and been a part of, uh, ample improvements here in 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 that model of uh, of providing assistance and and the effectiveness of that assistance to those that need it most. Thank you. Liz. I'm going to ask the same question to Jean Paul and then to Lucy. Um, Jean-Paul, uh, we've heard Nathan uh, really talk about um, getting communities back on the feet, the role of the private sector, the role of, uh, and, and Lucy talked a lot about the role of local government in that in that uh, context. What's been going on in France with regards to um, getting communities back on their feet, providing support through businesses? Um, has that been something that's been um, at the forefront of recovery efforts? Yes, uh, they were... Um a big economic effort from the from the state of course to help not so much the communities because uh, even if we are a very, we are a very centralized country there are uh, also some these concentrated uh, um, bodies uh, administrative bodies region and department in charge of um, supporting the communities but for the economic and the, and the companies. There was a big uh, kind of new deal in giving public money to to sustain uh, the the economy in France. And you know, it was a big surprise, big surprise, because in 2020 the number of mortgage was smaller than the previous years, and everybody said it will occur in 21. But now we are restarting without mortgage. So it's a real economic issue, a, a big question for all uh, um, searchers in economy about, uh, of course, the, the debt of the countries, the public money, the quakilankut, that was the words of Macron, quakilankut uh, means however it costs. And now, even if the, the government said we stop giving money to everybody because it restarts with very good numbers in growth, uh, ratio ratios in France. Uh, it, it's quite surprising for for, the, for them who are in charge of the crisis and the re resilience. But what I wanted to speak a little bit more is about the crisis because if you want to be more resilient, you have to manage proper your crisis and uh, about strategic advice because it was the first the second question of Kyle about strategic advice. You know, just one thing. It was a scientific body a committee uh, by the the first minister uh, the prime minister and and the, and the president and uh, for one year it was quite only scientific advice building crises day after day by observing not the future difficulty to plan but the the the, the time and on january that was a, a really a, a, a new uh, step in the crisis management the president didn't follow the scientific advice, saying, no, I don't do the lockdown. Hmm. I wait. And we avoid the third lockdown. And the third lockdown was 
very uh, uh, painful for the economy. And that was a very good choice. And afterwards, there was also very good management by with the sanitary pass and the obliging the person, including some reluctant population, to be vaccinated. In France, we have 67 million and we have 49 million person with at least one inject, one job of vaccine. It, it was also, it's also something uh, and hoped for us. Uh, so uh, we, we, it's, it's really a crisis. We don't know the future. And with uh, epidemic and epidemiologists, even if, uh, uh, if there is some model, it's impossible to predict the future. With a variant, it's impossible. Well, that's my, my first idea. And if I want to conclude about some big uh, lessons learned, uh, it's first is that uh, we have to identify where is the bottleneck of a crisis. It was very simple in all countries. It was the hospital, unable to accept all these victims. For us, it was not a crisis. We could all day transport all the person, even if there were many persons severely in, injured, uh, severely ill. Uh, the second is an economic uh, uh, lesson because some economists began to give some part uh, um, of uh, the, the, the saved uh, uh, things by uh, the injection of money in economy. And also uh, there was a talk of an economist, famous economist in France, telling that uh, vaccination was for some decade the best uh, um, value, uh, valuable uh, public policy because it cost three billions and it saves 300 billions because last year we lost 300 billions and uh, this year we didn't have this loss. And also what is important to notice, it's the number of uh, the, the death, uh, because if you, uh, there, is, there will be many publications about the deaths, around in France 120,000, but uh, what does it mean? If you vaccine, you avoid these deaths. And by the, the general economist, a life at a cost, a death as a cost. So if you vaccine, you save money as well. So that, that's very interesting. It's, a, it's really a gold mine, this crisis, for those who want to study. That's my opinion. Absolutely. Um, th there are so many um, lessons that uh, I think we're going to take away from this crisis and the lessons learned process. And I'm sure, Lucy, you're starting to think about what those lessons have been and the lessons learned process that are going on within local government. I think you mentioned also the, the, the impact assessments that are happening at the national level as well. Um, John Paul talked about the, the need to start reflecting on these lessons. I just wonder, Lucy, if you have any insights as, as to what those lessons might be for the UK and, uh, and what you're hearing from some of those impact assessments, some of those lessons learned processes that are ongoing. Yes, it's a very interesting one because obviously there's a big call in the UK and I'm sure it's mirrored elsewhere for one of our rather clunky vehicles for trying to extract lessons, which would be a very large public inquiry. Um, I think for those of us who've had concerns about the capacity of our National Health Service for a while, something around a commission that uh, looks again at things like our operational ability to respond is probably essential. One of the wonderful things about working in emergency planning is, you know, it's very easy to say that, that no lessons are learned, but one of the wonderful things in emergency planning is we do innovate constantly. So we have constant events where we say, what worked here? Can we change that? What didn't work here? We're incredibly agile as a profession. And one of the interesting things is, is reflecting for me personally, the difference between advising last summer and advising this summer on the winter. So there's literally a quote from a civil servant to me last year when we were planning for the winter and, it, and I was doing the meeting in July and she said, you know, we looked out the window and we really stopped paying attention because it was so sunny outside and Lucy was talking about the winter. And we couldn't believe her. We couldn't contextualize that the winter would be difficult. And this year you, you move forward. I actually, um, you know, speaking as myself rather than as the society, I've been exploring the issue of whether we will ever learn again because I work in disaster recovery. So I see us fail to learn so very often. You know, I see a fire 
caused by the same building issues here and in Italy. And I wonder whether, you know, next month I'll see one in Pretoria and then in Dubai. How do we learn? Will we learn? And one of the things I think as a commentator on disaster recovery is we, we are going to think we will learn a lot more about this than we ever will in order to get to a point where people feel like life is something akin to normal again. Um, one of the things that will happen politically is the squashing of our lessons. And do I therefore think, you know, that there will be a Stephanie and a Lucy in a hundred years time on perhaps an even more innovative form of technology? Maybe we'll be holograms doing this in a hundred years, calling for lessons to be learned. I'm afraid, yes, I do. Because one of the things as a disaster recovery is I go back hundreds of years and I'll look at things where, you know, the Great Fire of London, people are calling that this must never be allowed to happen again. And these are the lessons that must be learned. So I think there has to be a pragmatism about, about the balance between forgetting and, and, and going back. And I just, I mean, one thing I'd really like to point, pick up, if I may, on this point about community is uh, that's where I'm the wild card. That's where I would challenge. So I'm sitting in a lot of government meetings now where they're saying, you know, how can we make the community more engaged? How can we do all of this? This is, this is I, I have been involved as an activist in disaster management before. So I have been involved in disaster communities affected by disaster, but generally like all of us on this Zoom today, we're sat here as commentators or as recoverers. It's unusual to also be the affected. And one of the things that I find people, you know, saying to Duncan, perhaps, I haven't tried it yet, so I don't know if he's uncomfortable, but saying, Duncan, how do you feel as a survivor of the COVID-19 pandemic? And we sort of go, oh, well, you know, it hasn't been that bad. And, you know, I've still been able to work and all of these kind of things. So changing this alienation of who the community is in the pandemic to how do we, we want a meaningful recovery is the first act of the wild card and to stop the othering really of the idea of the community. What are we capable of? If we were told now by our local government that we are expected to donate maybe three nights a week to looking after older people in our community, have we got that time? And so one of the things that the wild card in recovery is doing a lot back into local uh, government is asking whether it's abusive or right to assume this shift onto a uh, community load. That is not the same as saying a community needs to be engaged. But when you are operating in a political society that is looking to outsource its work to other people. So one of the things that you know I'll try on the social media is challenge something and you, you know what you're going to get back. We are heavily reliant on the UK at the moment on volunteers to deliver most of our health aspects. And we've shifted from volunteers providing all of the infrastructure for our um, COVID vaccine to now asking them to deliver things like car park management and, and uh, managing signs and helping people with a cup of tea for our flu vaccine. At what point do we say this, this transfer of labor is, is wrong. We are a very well resourced health system. Many of our managers are on six figure sums in the National Health Service. Is this a correct use of community goodwill? Is it mis-selling the idea of community engagement? So that's why I get shown out of a, a lot of meetings a lot. Is <laughs> of community engagement. I'll stop there. Well, I hope that Jean Paul is not going to throw you out, but I see his hands up. Jean Paul, please. Yes, just some words about community uh, uh, resilience uh, to, 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 to be connected to Lucy. Uh, um, uh, my day-to-day -day business is to work with industrial hazards and Wi-Fi, you know, and uh, we don't really don't achieve to, to teach the people the good knowledge, uh, safe knowledge. Uh, when you have a smoke uh, uh, from a factory, you don't go in the school to take your children. And when you, uh, you are in a forest, you have to clear up around your house. It's very, very difficult. We work uh, uh, all the day on that. And now what we witness in this pandemic crisis, that in France now we have 67 million epidemiologists. Yes. Everybody yes. has its own opinion on that. So it means something. Maybe uh, it's a listener also. 
Uh, absolutely. And I think in the UK, we have 65 million experts and 65 million people who are thoroughly bored by it as well. And uh, they just want it to stop. Um, I, th I think the talk about community is one that completely fascinates me um, because I think that that is going to be one of the huge legacies um, that COVID um, has brought us that is a positive legacy. Um, Recognising that our communities are even more important and that they are willing to step up, as, as Lucy said, and step up on a continuing basis. Um, Stephanie, uh, Nathan, in your um, context, communities, I know in Mexico, they've been standing up all over. Um, what, what sorts of um, lessons do you think that that brings for recovery and, and how do we continue that? And in the way that Lucy has mentioned, how do we continue that work? Stephanie, I was, please. I was wondering, okay, so I was waiting for Nathan. So I think that uh, one, of the, one of the topics that was constantly mentioned either from Nathan John Paul was the co-responsibility in, in, in general terms and how we make access to this information that is being provided by the federal and the local government. And for the participation of different communities, is, this has to be an, an important role to uh, enhance what can be understand to really uh, uh, try to we have to to decrease our expectations on what we want from the public sector to be understood and to meet the needs of what the people need considers to be as an urgent matter something that has been um an initiative that was started to play the secretariat was these risk prevention committees but through the, with the pandemic one of the lessons learned was that there were other type of uh, perhaps non-formal type of organization that also work to attend a specific needs or to penalize the, the, what the people were considered as considering as an urgent matter. Or so, something that we have to comprehend is that there are different types of uh, organization. Not everything has to be created from scratch or as a new program we have to. Um, and this is something that we are constantly work, right now working on, on how to better engage, what to activate this type of dialogues on this is your, uh, this can be your social network of care. It can this network uh, uh, be in charge of your care, uh, of caring about you and your family. This is something that is somehow um, assume that someone someone will adapt you and someone will host you and your family, but we don't, we don't have this type of conversations that uh, make us interact within each other and talk uh, as a community level with our own neighbors on how do we solve this in a as in a, as a common problem. So I think that this is something that we need to understand. We need to open our, ourselves more. Uh, not everything has to be bureaucratized. We, we are now working on a registry, registration for partners on resilience. And it's not about um, working and, and saying open spaces for the same people that we have been working, but just going into territory with these non-formal workers and other, other sectors that, uh, and, and Nathan actually said, right, the heroes of the of the pandemic, the, the, yeah, so the janitors, and this is something that we have to continue uh, on the spotlight. Uh, yeah, great points. And one of the phrases that we've been using in the UK that Nathan used was whole of society. And interpreting that that means volunteers, as you said, public sector and businesses, as Nathan's already talked about. Nathan, you've talked passionately about the role of the public sector, uh, private sector, sorry, in this. Um, I wonder if there's if there's more that you'd like to say around the, that interface between public sector, local government and communities and, and that ecosystem around around recovery. Yeah, great. Thanks, Duncan Churton. And yeah, I certainly have. I, I believe this is uh, where the discussion you know, really needs to evolve uh, much more broadly than, than it has uh, in the past. And, and it's one of the things I'm hopeful for coming out of uh, this, uh, this, this long term crisis um, as, we, as we continue to reflect on it. Uh, is our ability to galvanize more of the community that's that's uh, impacted uh, by this situation, and we've got to get over this, uh, you know, the, the government centric uh, sort of approach, and realize that this, the solutions, frankly, are are often within communities. They're within, you know, within industry sectors. Uh, just the things that we rely on day to day, we've got to bring them into the fold as far as planning, preparedness, mitigation, etc. So. We've got to broaden this 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 uh, this discussion. We, we it's we've I think done a pretty good job. Continue to do a pretty good job between civilian and military authorities. 
We've got to move from Civ Mill to Civ Mill Commercial, Civ Mill Commercial Citizen. Uh, you know, this has got to be uh, more in the mainstay of, of our of our dialogue at, at, at really at all levels, but including among nations. I think this is where we get into, you know, what is the role of government, for example, as it relates to citizen preparedness. And as we've seen, uh, again, another uh, critical lesson out of this experience is that citizens are uh, an integral part, they're a critical part of the response, right? They, they are mitigating this, but, you know, we say mask up and social distance, you know, these common messaging, that the common messaging we've been promoting, they're a part of the response. I think this, really accents what I know in the US and elsewhere, we've been pushing this message of, you know, citizen responsibility here, citizen resilience. You have a role as a citizen for, you know, for your own safety and those in your family, those immediately around you, uh, neighbors and neighbor, you know, helping neighbors, that kind of thing. So it's, it's if, if this has to amplify and, and drive home really this message that uh, of, of citizen responsibility, the citizen, you know, angle on, the overall, uh, frankly, national response, because given our, our layered approach, uh, we've got to be mindful uh, of that as we as we go forward here. I think this, there's a lot we can learn from, again, the international community. I know a lot of the, the Nordic nations, for example, they're being very honest about with their communities, with their citizens, about the realities of a crisis, the realities that government's not going to be there right away. You know, you've got to maintain and, and sustain your your uh, your own uh, sort of life and safety priorities um, without government intervention, and I know there's they're, they're passing out brochures. You know, the Swedish model comes to mind, but others, you know, very honest with their citizens about what disaster looks like, what crisis means, uh, should it come to that, given again the increasing complexity and severity of the threats and hazards we face. And so it, this applies to the education community. We've got to get more involved with K through 12. We've got to work on the culture of preparedness here. Uh, in this country and many others, and and rem remember, you know, that, uh, as a friend reminded me recently, culture eats strategy. Okay, so we've got to be mindful that we, you know, if we 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 harness the power of, of of our national culture for a lot of different things, we should harness it for the power of resilience, because resilience, end of the day, I believe, is a national power, and it comes down to citizens of a nation, and of course, you know, as a, a more global inter interconnected society, we, we've got to be mindful that this 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 has bearing on our ability to maintain as a nation, our ability to maintain our national essential functions, those functions we must maintain under all conditions and preserve the way that uh, we go about our way of lives, the way that we uh, we, 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 we organize and, and govern uh, our societies. Uh, and so I'm hopeful we can reflect on this experience, the role of the citizen, the role of industry, role of government, evaluate legislation, ensure we have the necessary tools and resources to move ahead uh, and recognize what does it mean to make a, a nation resilient and uh, recognize that things like our democratic process and values, things like our national institutions uh, are so critical to uh, to that way of life and to uh, the functioning of, of a resilient nation. So just some, some added thoughts there, Duncan. I kind of expanded upon the citizen piece there, but the, the connectedness must be uh, maintained as the focus here as we work uh, collaboratively as possible. Thanks. Great, thank you. And just before I bring in Harold, I think exactly what you've said, Nathan, lies at the heart of a new initiative that we've been beginning in the UK called the National Consortium for Societal Resilience, bringing together all those actors that you've just mentioned um, from the four nations within the UK to talk about whole society resilience and start to change the way in which that's done in, in our countries. Um, Harold, I see no, you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Duncan. Uh, well, just uh, not actually triggered me because he mentioned the Nordic countries and we have been doing very well but different between the four countries and one thing which is uh, very very right about the Nordic countries is a high trust in government and this high trust is nothing that you can even expect when a crisis attack if you haven't built it in the past and uh, this uh, is something you have to think about. Uh, how do you build trust? You do that in peacetime. And you mentioned being honest. Yes, you, you, we listen to the government. If they say using masks, we use masks. And another thing is uh, the COVID was never politicized in, uh, in Norway. Like everybody agreed about how they handle it, there was no discussion between the political parties. And this also ended up with an irony because we just had an election 
and the governing uh, political party, they lost because they did very well during the pandemic, but they got no gain of that in the discussion after uh, the pandemic. It's not over, but we are coming very well through. Uh, there is a high um, uh, vaccination rate. I just saw we are up to 75% being vaccinated. 65% have got both vaccines. And we expect about 95% uh, vaccine uh, for the whole country. So these things probably are political issues. So, and you don't solve them by, uh, well, changing the system slowly. But the building trust is the one important thing. You see differences, though, between the Nordic countries. Norway, Denmark, and Finland have very few debts, while there are more debts in Sweden. And maybe that's due to the governance of the system. You have different ways. Who takes the decisions? Who do you listen to? Uh, and in Norway, there is no a discussion with uh, CDC, with the health uh, the directorate, and with the, um, with the government about uh, how did we do? And we see that there was a lot of discussion behind, behind the scene, but the government took a decision they thought was politically right, and it turned out quite well. I think I stopped there. So I'd just like to close as well by, by thanking all of our speakers. I think if there are three um, terms that have come screamingly um, through in all of the talks. It's about um, politics or non-politics. It's about whole society and trust. And it's about, um, obviously, there are many, many more issues, but those three seem to have really come out from, from all of the speakers. And I'd just like to thank um, Stephanie, Nathan, Lucie, Jean-Paul. Apologise to Jean-Paul for losing you ever so briefly um, during your talk, but thank you for persevering with us. Um, I'd like to thank Harold and Kyle for organising this today. And uh, I'll, I'll just hand back over to Kyle because I'm sure there are some wrap up things, but uh, just five minutes over. So given the, the scale of what we we're talking about today, um, uh, just thank all the speakers once again. Thanks, Doug. And yes, thanks, everybody, for attending the webinar today. It's a very interesting discussion and completely agree with your your kind of wrap up findings there, Duncan. Um, certainly, there is a lot more to unpack in this, and, I, and I'm sure we'll be discussing it for years. Uh, so there has been a few questions that we've had in terms of the Q&A as we get to the final administrative piece. Um, I will be sending those questions over to Duncan so he can have them as well. And uh, they'll, they'll be able to get those answers answered through a Manchester briefing or whatever the case is uh, that they're going to do to publish those. If you are uh, if you're joining us from the team side and you're not part of the Manchester briefing, go ahead and go over to the, to, it's, well, it's very easy. Just go Google it and <laughs> type in Manchester briefing, go find it. It's a great newsletter that comes out and you'll be able to, to see the good work that they're doing over there. And likewise, if you're with the University of Manchester or others and you want to take a look at the teams, the International Emergency Management Society, take a look at teams.info, T-I-E-M-S dot info. And there's an annual conference coming up in December to take a look at as well. So thank you very much, everybody. And we did go a bit long, but uh, it, again, it was a very long, uh, well, it's a very deep discussion, a lot of issues to come up. And once again, thanks to our panelists for joining us. And apologies for our sort of technical troubleshooting as we were going live here, but uh, very, very much uh, appreciate all of your efforts and your time and contributions to today's discussion. So thanks, everybody. Have a great day and have a great weekend. See you.